Hi everyone, this is Brett Hancock. Uh, this is a video I'm going to do right now. Not because I really wanted to do it the way that I'm going to do it here without actually making a much longer one with, you know, typical way I'm doing with PowerPoints and stuff, showing the actual evidence of the manuscripts and scriptures and showing the tangible, in a sense, I mean, obviously you can all you do is touch your screen, you can't actually touch it and see it, but <laughs> at least you could actually see the evidence, see the the proofs, quote unquote, that uh, I'm going to be talking about here, rather than me just giving a summary of it here. But I feel like out of necessity, there's so many people that are asking things about Matthew 19:9 that I feel I, I got to I got to do a prelude. I haven't been able to finish up uh, part 4C yet, and then I get to part five of my divorce and remarriage series, which will go into this much more thoroughly. But let me just run through why I'm convinced. Um, that Matthew 19 9 the way it is in our English Bibles uh, as best I know may, may, I, I've heard that the William Tyndale Bible um, that was done first that was the first English Bible he died as a martyr actually with that effort the Catholic Church actually put him to death and all he was trying to do is basically get instead of everybody being being locked up and only aristocrats and you know people of wealth being able to actually know Latin and therefore read the scriptures and even have access to the scriptures um, in their language he just wanted to get them to have the, you know, the Bible available in their language. And of course, in the 1500s is when the printing press came out. So things started really changing to where eventually in a very short period of time, people were starting to get access to the scriptures and stuff. So anyway, starting with that tradition into the King James and stuff, there's two basic major variants of Matthew 19.9. And shame on our pastors and on our Bible commentators and Bibles. Bibles. Um, I think the ESV is one of the few that that will have a footnote that will tell you there's actually a variant to Matthew 19.9. There's not very many that make this available. I just found this out, you know, a couple years ago. As, you know, four years ago, I started going down this path, learning to read the New Testament in Greek, and eventually in the last couple of years, getting, you know, pretty extensive collection of the, you know, oldest Greek manuscripts that we have. There's well over 5,800 New Testament Greek manuscripts. I think it's approaching 6,000 now. I've heard people throw out that kind of number. I don't know if they're just rounding up or what. But they just keep uncovering these manuscripts. Well, at the time that the, um, what later, after Erasmus died in the 1500s, you know, uh, one of the printing, uh, one of the printers, um, Robert Stephanus, he ended up calling at the Texas Receptus. But anyway, that family of different variations of what Erasmus, you know, started out with, he pulled together about half a dozen, if not a dozen at the max of about, you know, 12th century, give or take, manuscripts. There's nothing of from ancient antiquity involved in him making that Greek manuscript that William Tyndale would then use to do his translation that would ultimately end up after the Great Bible and the Geneva Bible and all these different Bibles. So eventually, you know, 100 years later, you know, the King James Bible and stuff, 1611. So anyway, I don't want to make this video about that, but basically... We, we just we just don't know we're not told that there's these two major manuscripts um, variations yeah there's little slight variations amongst many but they fall into basic main translations and or meanings I mean with negligible differences between them and so the ones that end up in all our Bibles King James on forward is this other variation and so I want to talk about the other one the other one actually is in the oldest manuscripts we have I mean, I've done this research. I have these at home. And when I do part five of my divorce and remarriage series, I'm going to show you guys these things, all right? And so, and, you know, try to help you to be able to see. And you can, since I'm showing them to you, you can go verify and see if I'm actually translating them correctly. And I encourage you to do so. I don't encourage anybody to take my word for, for stuff. To go do your re own research verification, like Acts 17, verse 10, 11. Be a Berean and, and verify. Go to the primary evidence to find out if what the claim is true. Um, and of course, in that particular instance, people were doing that with the scriptures, but that's just in general. If somebody tells you something, I mean, do your research, find out what they're saying is true, right? So anyway, um, so let's talk about Matthew 19.9. So Matthew 19.9, these oldest manuscripts, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth century, um, you know, manuscripts that we have that basically read like Matthew 5.32, because let me make this clear in case you're not following me. When we read the totality, as I'm presenting my divorce and remarriage series, I've done part one, I've done part two, I've done part 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D. That was a huge video that I had to break into four parts, you know, about 30 minutes each. And then part 4A and part, part 4B, and then I plan to do finish up part 4C very soon, hopefully, Lord willing. And then part five will be the expanse, the, the you know, unpacked version of what we're talking about right now. And I'm really going to show this this evidence. 
And I'm in Mac. There, in fact, when I do that, there will probably be evidence I'm going to forget to share with you right now because I don't have my notes with me. But just off the top of my head, I want to share this with you, just so you can see why I'm so convinced that Matthew 19:9 really the way Matthew penned it is that it really read like uh, Matthew 5:32. Because here's the thing: when you look at the totality of what the New Testament teaches on divorce and remarriage, everything seems to sing the same song of music. But when you get to Matthew 19:9, it's like you know, it's like, whoa, that doesn't seem to match. And yet when you read Matthew 19, 9, it starts out because Matthew 10, or excuse me, Mark 10, the first 11 verses read very similar to Matthew 19, 9, the first, you know, 10 verses, Matthew 19, verse, first 10 verses. And so it starts out the same way. And it's like, okay, there's a conversation between um, the Pharisees and Jesus. And, and Jesus is like, you know, cause they're like, Hey, you know, they just want him to verify that. Yeah, we can just fire our wives for any reason or whatever we can just divorce them and kick them the curb and move on to somebody else right and he's like whoa wait a minute and you know and he kind of sets that kind of tone the genesis like that's not how god did it in the beginning and he draws them back to that right and he makes it real clear by the context he's leading up to verse nine that's why verse nine is like wait a minute does that really match with what he's saying it's really clo uh, clear in verse nine that no Moses allowed you because your hard hearts to get a divorce, but it wasn't like that in the, in the beginning. In other words, in the book of Genesis, it wasn't like that. There's was one man, one woman, right? Kind of thing. That was the way God established with Adam and Eve. And admittedly, I mean, when you get to Abraham and Jacob and stuff, there was allowed not for divorce and remarriage, but there was allowed, you know, to actually marry with other wives, like we see with Jacob and stuff or whatever. So, but we're talking about divorce here, firing a wife and move on to someone else. Jesus is saying it wasn't like that in the beginning, but Moses allowed you because of your hard hearts, right? So, but when you get up to verse 9, it's like it doesn't match. But when you read Mark 10 and you read Luke 16, verse 18, you read uh, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, the way he contrasts between verse 31 and 32, I said, wait a minute. And and together with 1 Corinthians 7, what Paul is, um, uh, you know what he's going over and of course I'm look at all my videos I encourage you to look at them all and you know if you put them back to back there's that's a lot of footage that's a lot of video footage it's a lot to watch and so but it's if if this is your life is this your situation like it was for mine where I found myself divorced and remarried this is critical for your salvation and of course there's much more to salvation than divorce and remarriage but if you do all these other things and yet you're found by Jesus to be an adulterer it doesn't matter that you did everything else that's pleasing to him. It doesn't matter that you led two million people to um, conversion. It doesn't matter. Jesus, the Bible is clear. It says no adulterers will enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you're an adulterer in the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of God, when you stand before him, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's only one alternative. The Bible is very clear. Why is there light and dark? Why is there night and day? Why is there spring and fall? Why is there summer? There's only two variations. Why is there good and evil? All these pairs that God has put in nature, there's two variations. Either eternal bliss or eternal suffering. There's only two chance. There's only two options, right? And so Jesus died and suffered so that we would pay attention to what he says and that we will surrender and give our full allegiance to him. And not just so we can save ourselves. Jesus said, whoever tries to save his life will lose it. There's a lot of people who are just interested in, in saving themselves and not in exercising gratitude to what Jesus did for them. I can tell you, if that's not your heart, I mean, not just lip service to it, but not your heart, you're not going to make it. I guarantee you, you won't make it. I guarantee you, you won't make that. If you don't start getting your life in line with exercising gratitude, not outwardly, but from the heart, for what Jesus has done for you, and I fear for myself. I mean, it's a narrow road. It is a really narrow road. The more I've gone down this path, studying the early Christians, reading the second century, two dozen writings over and over and over, and then re-examining the New Testament in Greek and looking at the Greek Old Testament and looking on the scripture in totality and looking at the message, listening to these, those that knew the apostles, it's like, man, this is a narrow road, man. There really is. I mean, when that guy said that in the gospels, Lord, is only a few going to be saved? I mean, why did he say that? Because he's listened to the words of Jesus. That is not all recorded in the Gospels. Many people are deluded to think that the Gospels captured everything Jesus said. No, there's only just small pieces that God reveals and records. They heard so much teaching from Jesus. And it was a catalyst to them to say, 
Oh my goodness, is only a few going to be saved? Likewise, in Matthew 19, we get to verse 10. They hear in Jesus, which doesn't, and this is, I'm kind of going with this, with a list of evidences of why it reads. Originally, when when uh, Matthew wrote it, he wrote the book in Hebrew. As Eusebius and even uh, a disciple of the Apostle John Papias, both these ancient writers, you know, Eusebius is around 300 AD and Papias is around 100 when they're saying that, you know, Moses, or excuse me, I keep saying Moses, Matthew, the other M word, when Matthew wrote it in Hebrew, right? Eusebius expounds on what Papias is saying, that he wrote it in Hebrew, and he says that it was then translated, and everyone, in other words, the implication being that throughout the Greek regions, the, the providence, you know, the providences or the um, provinces or the uh, prefectures or states or whatever, whatever they were considered back then, or countries or whatever. But through that, that ancient land out there where everybody had a common language of Greek, a little bit similar to how there's a common English language today, but anyway, that common language of Greek, when, when uh, people got the Hebrew, there were people that could translate Hebrew and probably at varying levels of capability, who knows. But for whatever reason, um, you know, Eusebius records in there that everyone translated as best they could. Now to me, this is supposition. Or, I mean, this is uh, speculative and stuff. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely say. But it, to me, it makes sense of why we have these two major variants. That's the reason. That's the reason. And maybe somebody was leaning towards, you know, actually, you know, in the direction of where it's fallen today with that particular variant to where, you know, there's divorces and remarriage and stuff or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't say, but there F definitely is two variants. And one of them reads like Matthew 532, the oldest ones we have second, third, there's, there's a couple, uh, manuscripts in second, and third century, um, you know, uh, uh, fourth century is two, the Codex Anaticus, Codex, Vatic Codex Vaticanus. And that's why Satan has used people, very well-meaning people, typically King James only as people, you know, minded where they're just reckless they have no fear of god man I, i'm telling you they have no fear of god they shoot their mouth off with their gossip that they've heard about the septuagint and about these ancient manuscripts and codices and they don't know what they're talking about they can't speak the language they've never studied this stuff they give no evidence of this stuff in fact they typically don't give any real evidence for why they're saying what they're saying and yet they slander these ancient codices which is a latin word for book and it dispels all this, and this is the work of Satan, so people can't see this stuff. So they'll either not pay attention or whatever, and they'll continue in their divorce and remarriage. And they think that they're actually helping people with divorce and remarriage because they got an alternative explanation and stuff or whatever to fill the gap and stuff. But truth is what saves. Jesus is what saves and stuff. So anyway, I apologize for getting a little excited there, but I mean, this is a very important topic. So anyway, let me continue on here. I apologize for that. Anyway, so getting back into it. So here's some of the evidences besides um, laying the groundwork that the major variance of Matthew 5.32 is the way it reads. And, and I did a video on Matthew 5.32. I encourage you to look at that where I basically say, here's the purpose of Matthew 5.32. Here's the point Jesus was making in that video, right? So I encourage you to take a look at that. Matthew 5, 9, or 19.9, as it reads now, is later manuscripts, Okay. And it basically does it legitimate translation. I mean, I'm looking at it. People got all these posts on Facebook and like, oh, it doesn't shouldn't be translated that way. And they get on this theology. It's like, no, man, sorry. The way it reads, the way it reads. The thing about it is, is it was originally written Hebrew. Everybody translates the best they could. And there's in the way the Greek is different than English. There's one key word, whether it's actually as a past tense uh, verb or whether it's actually a passive form of the infinitive. The where that either makes it that the husband is causing the wife to commit adultery or whether the husband is committing adultery if she's not committing porneia, right? If he remarries, right? And so it's huge. It's tied up in just like a few words, especially this one key word that is basically the word for, uh, you know, adultery. And so that's the huge hinge pin right there. And so if somebody saw it differently, they translate this way. And they're reading the Hebrew. They understood, you know, okay, well, you know, whatever. And so anyway, so so that's that. So here, what's the evidence that it is Matthew 5.32? Well, number one is, is that when we look at the early Christian commentaries, like Origen did one. Um, I think there was one also. I think I looked at John Chrysostom, which would be 4th century. But Origen is in early 3rd century. And when he describes, when he's going through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 of Matthew, when we get to chapter 19... What we would consider Matthew 19, because they didn't have chapters and verses back then. But when we look at it, 
There's nothing in there that would resemble in our modern Bibles, Matthew 19, 9. It, it resembles Matthew 5, 32. So that's, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, okay, that's interesting. And, I mean, that's not um, a smoking gun or anything. That's not conclusive all by itself. But that's interesting, right? So then it's like, okay. And then I got a hold of the Dia Tesseron that was basically a conflation of the four Gospels by, um, uh, by a guy named Tatian who was a disciple of Justin Martyr. And faithful, as long as Justin was alive, he was a faithful disciple. But after Justin died, he did kind of go off a little bit, various, you know, ascetic and stuff in areas and some extremists and th stuff, whatever, but still held to the basic um, tenets of the, of, the, of the teaching and stuff. But anyway, he early on, you know, um, he right probably around 160 during Justin's life is the way, is the way it seems. Um, he basically um, did for the church a, a translation that is basically a conflation or a, a mixture of pulling together chronologically and making one gospel out of the four gospels, right? So that when we look at the Dia Tesseron and we look at its translation, now it's not from Greek, but I mean, I think it's... I forget whether it's Aramaic or Coptic or whatever, but the translations of it, or Syriac, I think it is, when we look at it, it's like, man, there's no Matthew 19, 9 type language in his part of where he's talking about this divorce and remarriage, and, th and it, actually in the whole totality of the writing from what I've seen. But this whole thing, it reads like Matthew 5.32, and there's all the parts that you would see that recognize the elements of what we would recognize in Luke 16.18 there, um, Mark 10. You know, Matthew 5, 31, 32, it's all pulled together, like I said, because that's the way he did this gospel, just kind of pull it all together. And it reads like Matthew 5, 32, and I go, okay, wow, that's interesting too. And so, um, one huge piece of evidence was Matthew 19, verse 10. We look at Matthew 19, verse 10, I think that really exposes the way verse 9 is supposed to read, okay? And so, basically the way it reads in Greek, and all the Greek manuscripts, and the tr the translations water down this key word, I, hey, Itia, you know, that is the cause, or Itia, all by itself, cause, you know. That's basically what that word means. Well, they translate as case, right? And that kind of blinds our eyes to not really see when the, when the apostles um, are coming in, it says that when Jesus' disciples, they come in, they say to him, and they say, Right after he said verse nine, uh, verse nine in Matthew nineteen nine. This is verse ten. They're recording it. It said they came to him and they said, uh, "Lord, if that's the the way they translate it, if that's the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry." But when you see it's actually the cause, right? If that's the cause of the man with his wife, it's like, okay. Well, verse nineteen nine, or excuse me, chapter nineteen nine. That's what we're trying to decide here. Is it supposed to read where the man is the cause of divorce, causing the wife to commit um, adultery? Um, uh, or is it that if he divorces her and remarries, unless she's committed, is it, which, which one is it? Is it about him being a cause or about her being the cause, right? If she commits pornea, right? And so now with these disciples coming to him and saying, if that's the, um, Lord, if that's the cause of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. In other words, not even to put yourself at the risk of causing her, stumbling her, that you're going to have to give an account and you'll be responsible for her blood on, on Judgment Day kind of thing, whatever. That makes it pretty clear to me, and that's not all the evidence. There's more evidence. When you look at that, man, like that is internal evidence within the manuscripts that are actually used today in our Bibles. They just translate them all as case instead of cause. And yet in verse 3, um, and, and the word IT is all throughout the New Testament. It's in the Greek Septuagint, and we've got tons of, you know, even in the, I encourage you to look that up. It, in English alphabet, it would be A I T I A. And, you know, it's feminine noun. You can look that up in Strong's Concords, and you'll see that it translated as, and, and they might put in there after they say cause and fault and all that type of language. They might put in there comma case, just because that's what they've done. They've translated as case. But it's like the word case and the understanding of the word case is not a cause, right? And so, uh, so anyway. Um, so what was it? Some of the other evidences, um, I'll pull them all together in, in, um, divorce and remarriage part five. Um, let me see if I can think of some other ones. Those are pretty telling there what I'm saying. Let me see if I can think of another one. Okay, folks. So yeah, reflecting on, I'm probably forgetting some things, but definitely just the totality of the anti-Nicene fathers, 10 volume set. If you were to have a hard copy set up on your shelf, probably at least three feet wide or something whatever it's just from sweeping from the late first century um 70 80 a.d all the way up to about 300 325 something like that these early christian writings there's nothing in there that would point to a, 
our modern understanding of Matthew 19.9. There's no exception clause in that sense. And the exception clause are what Matthew 5.32 says, where it doesn't allow for remarriage. That's, that's what the exception clause really is saying. Um, but the fact that the word accept is used in Matthew 5.32 is saying, except that the woman is committing pornea and he divorces or remarries, he's going to be the cause of her adultery. So the exception clause in that sense is he won't be guilty of uh, her adultery if he uh, divorces her and she's committing pornea. So if he divorces her or puts her away, looses from her, I didn't want to say divorce because there's no legalities in that word, but if he puts her away, whether it's like he puts her out of the house or he, he separates himself or whatever, and she's committing pornea and then goes off and, you know, commits um, adultery or... I believe many people that read ancient Greek is that we see from many passages that pornea just is not a premarital understanding of fornication, that it's actually any kind of unlawful sexual activity. I mean, I had that conversation with, you know, my professor who speaks Koine Greek fluently, like I can speak English, right? And uh, Dr. Christopher Rico in uh, Jerusalem in the Polis Institute. And, you know, with some others, too, that don't know it that well, but they know it. They're teachers. I mean, they teach Koine Greek. I mean, I mean, not to mention, I mean, I've looked at passages in the Greek Septuagint and put them together what I see in the New Testament. It's like, this is not premarital relations, but it's using porne or whatever. So, anyway, this video is not about that, but... Anyway, so all that to say is is that, uh, you know, in their anti-Nicene fathers, there's, there's nothing in there would resemble... A Matthew 19 9 as we understand it today it resembles a Matthew 532 and again if you're not understanding what I'm saying if you were to like copy and paste Matthew 532 and put it and paste it over Matthew 19 9 now your Bible would read like the oldest manuscripts all right so I'm just gonna stop right there God bless you now think about that because that's the hole in the boat the, the existing Bibles even the King James that's the hole in the boat now here's the thing here's the props to the King James I'm glad I thought to say that was the very last part of the King James that has there where it says in anyone who marries this is evidence as well anyone who divorce that marries her who has been divorced commits adultery that passage is in all these passages I mean I think it's there's a very rare exception that all the way sweeping through the first millennia of all these just thousands of manuscripts that we have um, well, I guess we, we do have thousands of manuscripts, but they're not all Matthew 19, uh, chapter 19. So anyway, the hundreds of manuscripts that we have from Matthew 19, when I'm looking through my catalog and showing all these, I'm looking at the variants and stuff, that last part that I just mentioned, man, it's in all of these, sweeping all the way from the earliest in the second century, sweeping all the way, you know, well off into the second millennium, you know, which would be back, you know, um, you know, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, that's the second millennium. We're in our, we're in the third millennium now. So anyway, just uh, let me just leave that with you. I hope that helps you. Um, just really think about that. The totality of the teaching, according to the evidence, is that Matthew 19.9 doesn't exist. There's no hole in the boat. There is no allowance for remarriage. It's always adultery. As the scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9-12, and then other places, no adulterers are in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, God bless you.